This is a quick pop-up video for those who are parachuting in and trying to figure out what's the lay of the land of post-humanism. So post-humanism looks at and calls into question basic ideas of what it means to be human. I mean, basic ideas, it's the ideas of what it means to be human that we've kind of grown up with. It's ideas that we've inherited uh, for generations, really since the Enlightenment. And much of what I have to say today and through this idea of posthumanism comes from Michel Foucault's essay. Uh, he's a late 20th century philosopher. He has an essay called What is Enlightenment? And Foucault uh, was influenced by a late uh, 19th century German philosopher, Friedrich Nietzsche. In any case, uh, posthumanism uh, troubles the notion of what it means to be human. Often uh, during the Enlightenment, or we even today have this inherited notion, that there's some fundamental universal essence, right? All humans are created equal. Right? We even have this in the founding document called the Constitution, which reads, all men are created equal. Now, already there's a problem with that, right? It's men, not women. And not all men were created equal during uh, the 1700s, 1776, in the Constitution, because there were slaves who clearly were not equal to those who owned them, at least not equal in terms of their rights and privileges within the society. So what we find is that who's human and the degrees of humanness of those humans has changed over time. That is, what it means to be human is historically constructed. If it's historically constructed, then there's no singular universal. Now, Enlightenment might... Uh, thinker might say, well, or even today we might think, well, we're just perfecting the idea of what it means to be human. Eventually we'll get to truly what it means to be human. But in post what we begin to think is, no, in fact, this is always an ongoing project that changes according to different historical periods and different cultures where we are in the world. Now, uh, to, look, to look further into some examples of how post humanism might trouble essentialist ideas of the human, uh, we can consider the mind-body split. So Descartes has the idea that he can think and that reason is primary and it precedes uh, the body. The body can't be trusted because there are optical illusions and f feeling, sense of touch, sense of taste um, uh, can be delusional. But reason has a cold, clear insight into things. And uh, today, in post as we'll see, it, uh, its understanding is you can't think without a body. So, all thought is bodily thought, or as Wittgenstein said, uh, early 20th century uh, thinker, he said, if a lion could talk, we couldn't understand it. So if a lion could speak English, we wouldn't understand it because its needs, its body, its way of seeing the world would be so fundamentally different that even if it spoke English, we'd have no concept, we'd have no common basis for those worlds, uh, because it lives in a different sort of body. So uh, this is a sort of fundamental notion that uh, for posthumanism is that we're bodily beings and that we're beings who are thrown into a world, a world that has particular types of technologies and our thought is shaped by the technologies around us. The fundamental technology, in fact, being language. Language is a technology. But then all the other sort of apparatus that surround us. And some of those apparatus are culturally determined, regionally determined, uh, economically determined, and all those shape identity and thought. Another example of post-humanism is the notion of memory, that we construct a narrative of the self. Post-humanism 
often posthumanism often thinks there's no singular self, but the self is the convenient narrative that we construct at any particular time. So if I think of myself, or ask you to think of yourself, when you uh, introduce yourself, you're not going to give every moment in the history of your life. Instead, we often actually think of ourselves based on highlights of our life. And as time goes on, which highlights, which things are important, change. Which things we value, change. And so we, have a, we create a new narrative, a new narrative for, and a new sense of who we are. So self isn't uh, a steady or singular thing. Another example of this is that which self are we talking about? For example, I'm a professor, but I'm not always a professor. That's one self. Uh, another self is I'm an administrator. Another self might be that I'm a friend to someone. Another that I'm um, a parent or a lover or um, a child, um, etc. So we have a whole sets of relationships, and each of those are a slightly different sense of self. Right? And we think, well, no, there must be some core self that informs all of these other selves. But in fact, what we find is that these are different, differently constructed narratives, some of which have patterns, but also some that have anomalies to them. And then we try to create new narratives to account for the anomalies. But then that throws out something different that doesn't account for other elements of the self. So we never arrive at a homogenous self. Another example of this problem is that, um, is it the self that is listening to the video now, or this uh, myself that's talking now? Or is it the self that is uh, getting streams of email or getting uh, text messages on the phone? Uh, we have multiple selves at the same time. They're, they're all happening. Or is it my Facebook self? Is it my Twitter self? All those are happening right now, even when I'm not aware of it. And this is, was one of, uh, in fact, uh, Freud's great insights, is that much of the sense of self isn't rational, it isn't conscious, it's unconscious. That the conscious and rational self is just the tip of a greater iceberg of uh, motivations and proclivities that we can't fully grasp. So the post-human self is, a, is much larger, more amorphous. Um, it has tendrils into uh, technology, into animality, into the unconscious, into different temporalities, into power relationships, because there's the sort of uh, self of teacher-student, there's the self of parent-child, etc. Um, so there are a number of different power relationships that help us to uh, position ourselves and by which we construct a self. So we'll look at a variety of these things in understanding what does it mean to be human uh, in the world today. And that meaning, what it means to be human, is in fact post-human.